And I'll start the Perfect. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, we're glad you could join us today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Cindy Olson. And in a former life, I was the CHRO of Enron and on the executive committee. And today, the founder of the Executive Strategic Alliance, and we're uh, Anna, John, and I are so happy that you guys joined us today. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first, you notice that we are recording this, and we will send the recording to you in a follow-up email, as well as a as well as a uh, deck, uh, par partial deck that uh, Neil shares with us today. And then, feel free to ask questions anytime by putting in them in chat, and then I will make sure they're answered by Neil or Matt or John, whoever the question's uh, directed to. So for the past six years, we at ESA have partnered with ADP to build this executive community of over 1,200 participants in 20 cities. Starting out delivering world-class thought leadership and exposure to next generation uh, uh, technologies. We're unique in that we bring CHROs, CIOs, and other work tech executives together because we believe that they all have to be in lockstep with each other to deliver the kind of worker experience necessary to attract and retain talent, especially now. In addition to thought leadership, we also offer a look at innovative work tech startups and exposure to potential startup advisory board positions for our network. And finally, we offer a unique board positioning membership that will provide all in one place, the resources and executive needs to ultimately secure their perfect public, private or startup board seat. So we are so excited and really appreciative and fortunate to have Neil Gandhi with us again. Neil's a partner with McKinsey. He focuses on HR, talent strategy, and productivity. He's passionate about the power of people and specializes in ad advising clients on how HR and talent can create maximum value for their organizations. He regularly helps industry leaders and global organizations to improve their HR operations, talent management capabilities, and efficiency along with their broader business support structures and processes. Joining Neil, we have two amazing uh, senior leaders, senior executives, John Shaw, um, who serves as Kiewit's, uh, Kiewit Corporation's Vice President of and CHRO. In his role, John and his team manage Kiewit's human resources team, supporting 27,000 employees geographically dispersed across the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Under John's leadership, he directed the restructuring of human resources across the company to create a more efficient and effective HR model. And that new model enabled Kiwit to lower headcount by 30% while provi providing aligned best in class services to the business. John joined Kiwit in 2011 and has 26 years in various senior HR roles across healthcare, banking and construction industries. And in addition, we have Matt Holt. Matt's the Vice President of Human Resources for Dot Foods, a position he's held since 2008. During his 26 year tenure at Dot, Matt has developed well-rounded well -rounded insight into the business. He began his career in sales as a district and regional sales manager and then moved to transportation manager and then various and was in charge of various distribution centers across DOT's network. Matt leads DOT's culture committee, chairs DOT's diversity leadership group, and is an advisor for DOT's women's leadership group. We have an amazing group today. Welcome everyone. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Neil. Cindy, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here all with you and, uh, and go through a set of topics uh, on talent. Talent broadly, we're gonna talk about what's going on today in the world of work. Um, and here, here's what I, I propose. I'm gonna, in a second here, share my screen and go through a, a small handful of pages that, that present some of the research that we've done on uh, the workforce. Uh, what is the current state of the workforce? People coming, people going, and, um, and sort of lay a little bit of a, of a uh, a fact-based foundation. 
then then what I'd love to do is um, prompt and, and make sure that John and Matt have a chance to talk about some of the things they're seeing that, you know, whether it's those trends or some of the things that they're doing in reaction to some of those trends. Um, I think then, then you know, we'll, maybe we'll take a, a second to, to uh, have a bit of a discussion, see if some, some questions that you guys um, have, and, and, and please do put them in the chat as we go. And then there's some uh, additional perspectives in terms of trends that we're seeing uh, in terms of organizations and how they're responding to some of the challenges that, that we can go through after that. Um, again, uh, like Cindy said, let's, the, the hope is that this is as interactive a session as, as possible. Um, and uh, and with that, maybe I will get uh, I will get us started. So just to confirm, you guys are all seeing uh, seeing my screen. Great. So let's start with there is clearly something going on that's a little bit different in the workforce today. Um, so maybe that's maybe that's obvious. Maybe that should be obvious, right? Between the pandemic. Oh, 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 there you go, Jack. Thanks. Between the pandemic uh, and what that has done in terms of changing how people work for some some set of folks, but also changing, in many ways, just the social social dynamic that we've all gone through. Uh, you probably would expect that there's that there's going to be implications or ramifications to the population broadly and therefore the workforce. Um, and it seems like it's true. When we do the research, when we ask employees about their work and how they think about work, we see a few things. 42% um, of women, 35% of men reported being you know, often or almost always burned out. We see real concerns around well-being. We see significant differences from before the pandemic on this topic of mental health. Um, and so regardless of how you measure it, what does seem to be true is that there is, there is something going on. There is something changing with the workforce and with our employees. And it's showing up. It's showing up in that you have significantly more employees, significantly greater likelihood of employees to think about leaving what they do, think about leaving either their job or even their, uh, the, the work that they're in, and think about where they work and why they work in the place that they do and what might be on the other side, uh, other side of, of, of the fence. So we're seeing all of that happen. And it shows up. It shows up in the macro stats. Um, if you kind of trace it from 2020, right? You have uh, employers, uh, essentially not letting go of nearly as many employees, but you see significantly elevated quit rates and that has not abated. So, you know, this, we've been talking about this, the great attrition, great resignation, whatever you want to call it. We call it the great attrition um, for some time. And the, the thing about it is that it hasn't, it hasn't moderated. Quit rates, even in the most recent month of data, April, are still as high, essentially as high as they've ever been. And the result is, very significant number of job openings. Um, and, and look, the, the macro says this, anecdotally what we hear is, it's really hard to fill jobs. It's really hard to fill jobs uh, at the front line and low wage, uh, uh, the low wage spectrum of the workforce. It's really hard to fill jobs at the upper end of the wage spectrum. It's really hard to fill jobs at scarce skills like it's always been, but that's bordering on impossible in many places. And, and, and so the, the question is why, why is this going on and, and what, what can we do about it? Let me talk about four things in the data that may point us in a direction and then, and then I'll pause. So the first is what is going on behind attrition? Can we figure out why, why people are coming, why people are going? And the second is to think about some of the ways in which career paths and structures have changed. Um, the third is is the is what do employees value? Is what's the value proposition? And the fourth is around what the pandemic has done for for social capital or basically networks within within organizations. So let me let me talk about this first point. This is research that we did on asking employees were they considering leaving their job, and we found that forty percent of the people we asked said they were at least somewhat likely to leave their job in the next three to six months. Um, of those people, we found that 64% that would do that without having another job lined up, which 
we think is probably you know double what it was before. We think that chart on the right prior to this this sort of labor phase we're in would have been exactly flipped. Now, excuse me, this is a survey from the fall of 2021. And this largely came true. And if you look at the quit rates and you add it all up, this essentially came true. So, so we redid the survey. I, it's not here on a page because the data hasn't been published, but we do have a sense. It was just came back from the field a couple of weeks ago. We do have a sense as to what, what did this look like right now? Sort of the April, April, early May, uh, same version of the question. And the thing that we found is that this number, 40%, asked the same question, is now 38%. It's not meaningfully different. So we would expect, given that this question led to, you know, predicted some set of, of labor market movements, we would expect this to continue. So, you know, inflation isn't going on, there is the risk of a recession. So we don't know what's going to happen. But in the current state, employees are still very much thinking about their relationship to work and thinking about it in the context of whether or not they want to stay in, in their job. One of the reasons that we think this is going on is that there actually might be, we might be in a world of, it's actually simply elevated job movement. So from if we were to go back in time, five years ago, 10 years ago to today, we probably should expect some more job movement. If we think about kind of traditional career trajectories, and this is a you know relatively high skill example, but we see variations of this across the skill spectrum, uh, where you know traditional paths would be a pretty stepwise through the hierarchy uh, of maybe one two sort of employers at best um, or at most to what we see more of now, and this is something that we've seen really accelerated in the pandemic where ads are more horizontal than they are vertical, although they absolutely have advancement, and across a broader range of experiences. So you see traditional employers in there, you see gigs, you see different kinds of startups, you see people leaving the workforce for a while and coming back, all being things that are more desired by employees, also more tolerated by employers, accepted by employers, that is what they will find in the, in the set of people that they have. And so it's possible that a certain amount of the movement that we're seeing is structural. It's also possible that employers and employees have a bit of a mismatch. Now I'm going to pause on this page and explain it. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff here, so I'll give you a chance to really, uh, really look at it. But let me, let me orient you to what, what this data is. The, the vertical axis is employees and asked what they take into account when they think about staying or leaving. The horizontal axis is what employers take into account or what employers believe employees take into account uh, when it comes to staying and leaving. So the top right is where employers and employees essentially are thinking in lockstep, right? They're understanding each other. Uh, and, and what you see when you look at the top of the chart in the middle and the right side of the chart is a little bit of a mismatch. There is a set of transactional factors on the right, you know, in inadequate compensation, looking for a better job, that tend to be what employers look to first. And there's a set of relational factors in the top middle of this that tend to be what employees look to first. And, and this mismatch between you know, a focus on transactional levers to, to attract and retain versus some, some of the relational levers to attract and retain is also part of what we think is going on, or at least is a indication of what might be some of the ways to respond to elevated attrition and movement in the workforce. Hey, Neil. Yeah. Can I ask a couple questions that are in chat? Yeah, go ahead. So Eric Almo, BMC, He's asking, are there are there sub patterns here according to industry? So the answer is is both yes and no. When you do this uh, research across industries, what we find is is that the relative patterns so of this mismatch of what employees want, employers say, and really what matters is what employees are are saying they want, tends to be essentially the same across industries. There might be you know very slight differences. 
what you do see is that in the, especially the most recent research where we have the sample to do it, the, the, that 40% number in terms of in, you know, indicating that they're thinking about leaving, it varies quite a bit by, by industry. Some of the financial and financial services industries see quite high numbers, like significantly higher than 40. We see others where you know, it gets down into the high 20s and that's sort of the range that we see. So, so yes, in terms of absolute and then no, in terms of looking at employee perspectives and preferences, if that makes sense, Cindy. Thanks, Neil. And Thomas Smouse, he's asking, are you seeing a difference in resignation data between salary professionals versus craft skill roles? For the most part, no. Um, if I were to get really nuanced about it, you probably do see a little bit of a difference where there's probably elevated movement in the, in the lower wage, which is not necessarily equivalent with skill, but in the lower wage parts of the workforce, you see elevated movement in the higher wage parts of the workforce. And you see somewhat less than that in the middle, uh, in the middle of the workforce. I, I don't know why that's the case. I can speculate. I think that's a part of the workforce that's probably been under pressure for, for quite some time. Um, and so the, the sense of security in terms of going to the next job may not, may not be quite as robust as with the others. Um, but but that's, that's probably the, the nuance that you'd see. Um, otherwise, by skill level, we tend not to, in the research, see meaningful differences. One more question that just came in from Matthias. Do you see differences based on geography? Some high cost states versus lower cost states? For the most part, no. For the most part, no. We saw some differences nine months ago by, uh, by country. Um, and when we expanded the sample in other countries, this time we found that essentially the patterns remain the same you know, in Europe and in parts of Asia where we're able to do this survey, but uh, the kind of the absolute levels are a little lower overseas, but within the US, we haven't seen a, a significant amount of variation. So one, one more, well, actually two more. Do these figures have any noticeable differences by generation? So we're actually studying that now. Um, and so I don't have the, the sort of research-based answer on that. Um, there's kind of the intuitive or anecdotal, which is some of these things probably, the movement probably represents a, um, uh, you know, basically a younger demographic moving into the workforce. Uh, at this point though, you know, my sense is that you know, if you, this is essentially representative of the majority of the workforce and the majority of the workforce, actually the vast majority of the workforce at this point is represented by Gen Z and millennials um, when, you, when you think about the workforce in, in aggregate. Uh, and so, so I, there probably is some, some generational differences in there, but we are capturing the majority of the workforce in this. Thank you. That's it for now. Yeah, let me let me cover one more point and then and then I want to uh, uh, two more points. Then I want to open up to John and to Matt. The other thing that that does appear to be true in COVID, this I think applies to to frontline uh, folks as well as your desk employees in, in headquarters or corporate, which is the social connections that are part of what drives work or employee experience have, have probably frayed to a certain extent, right? So you know, over time, your network should grow. Over time, you should feel more connected to people in your network, in your employer. You should have more contact, yet very, very small percentages of people report that sort of thing, right? In an ideal world, these would be 100%, 100%, 100% because that is part of what growth is as, a, as an employer, as a worker, and we're not seeing it. And so you can infer from this that some of that social capital has frayed and it has a real impact. It has a real impact also on some of our, our underrepresented populations. This is stats for women, the, the, the similar research on whether it's black or LGBTQ plus or, or, or other underrepresented populations 
in many workforces um, show this, right? Like the, this social capital piece, the network, the connections is affecting some groups disproportionately. So, so if, I, if I say like that's the kind of the, the backdrop, just a handful of assorted facts on what we're seeing, I, I thought that I might pause on this chart for a minute and say, you know, we're, we've talked about the great attrition. So what are some of the root causes that we think people are, are leaving and, and why? We've also asked folks who've left their jobs over the last year, why'd you come back? Um, and so this idea of bringing people back in and, and turning the great attrition to the great attraction. And, and this is what we found. We found a few, a few things that really popped, um, you know, with flexibility being at the top. Now, I wanted to spend a minute just talking about this idea of flexibility because these conversations, and I do this sort of thing a lot, we almost always get into remote work, hybrid work pretty fast. And, and it's an important thing and we can talk about it. Uh, there are parts of the workforce that have very concrete preferences for being able to work um, where they want to work. But, you know, that applies to essentially, you know, a small segment, maybe it's not small, but a, a, a minority segment of the workforce, right? There's a large part of the workforce that does not have that kind of geographic or locational flexibility in where they work. Yet still flexibility pops. It's the thing that is the most cited as why you come back to work, why you leave work, regardless of whether it's at the top end of the labor force or the bottom end of the labor force and, 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 and frontline or, or corporate. And so I think that there's something in this, like flexibility is, is uh, it appears to be the, the thing that pops, but, but that's actually quite a hard thing to define. Um, and I thought it might make sense to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Matt, I know you, you guys at Dot Foods have spent quite a bit of time thinking about flexibility as it applies to your different segments uh, of workers. Maybe talk a little about what you're seeing on that. Thank you, Neil. Um... Yeah, so you know, Dot Foods is a food distribution company that has, uh, you know, our biggest two employee groups are warehouse workers and truck drivers, and so we're trying to figure out how do you uh, 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 act on this desire for more flexibility by all these employee groups. So we've been challenged, for example, on truck drivers to address their need for flexibility, and with truck drivers, for example, schedule predictability uh, is really important to them. So as an example of something we've tried, we created this job that's a, called a four by four job, which essentially is you work four days, you're off four days, you work four days, you're off four days. So in six months or nine months, you know, a driver knows if they can make a dance recital or a wedding or a child's baseball game because of the certainty of the four on four off. So uh, schedule certainty is one way we've applied, you know, flexibility to our truck drivers. Um, with warehouse employees, a very different employee type, they need to be on site inside of our buildings. Uh, so we've um, radically expanded the number of shifts that are available so that people are more likely to be working a shift that matches their, their needs and wants. And then on top of that, we've got a lot of arrive late, leave early programs. Uh, 10 years ago, if you're five minutes late or leave five minutes early, there's a discipline you know, attached to that. And we've tried really hard to move away from that with flexibility on, we call it give me five. Uh, you know, so if someone just needs uh, you know, to come late, leave early or, or do something in the middle of the day, uh, they can. So we're, um, I'd love to hear what others are trying, but those are some examples of what we're trying with flexibility for non-desk employees. We're, we're doing, I think a lot of things that you are probably all doing with your desk employees with work from home and remote employees. We're certainly doing those as well, but the, the, the biggest challenge that we've got is uh, with non-desk employees and how to provide them with more, more flexibility. Uh, that's really interesting, Matt. Thank you. I, it's it's some, I, some pretty innovative things to do with, with, uh, with that part of the workforce. John, um, I, whether it's about flexibility or, or in general, how have you how have you all been able to think about you know this idea of bringing people back of of you know whether it's the folks who've left you or just who left the workforce how, how how have you thought about that? Well, yeah, obviously in this current environment, but it's something we've been doing for a while. You know, if we do have somebody that's really a high performer that thinks about leaving, 
obviously we sit down with them, try to talk to them. And, and you know, we've been successful on, on retaining some of those folks and, and just getting them to understand, you know, what, you know, their concern may be something that's not valid and we can fix. But those that are still really good that are, are thinking about, they, they, they do decide to leave. We, we try to be pretty open with them and say, hey, let us know when you're ready to come back. And, and the reason I kind of state that is, you know, we don't want them to think, okay, you're burning a big bridge here. You know, this is not something that, uh, that you feel we feel comfortable coming back to. So with that, um, every year we go and we print off all of our high performers who voluntarily left us within the last two to three years. We send that back out to our districts and our business units and say, hey, who would you like to have back in this particular group? And if they said, hey, I'll call them directly. I want this person. I want this person. Or if they are like, okay, have recruiting, call them and start having discussions with them again. And we've been quite successful in regards to bringing a lot of people back uh, that way. And I think, again, it's that opening that door where they may have felt like, okay, maybe I burned a bridge by leaving that company, but, but you really didn't. Uh, here we're reaching back out and, and trying to bring you back. And, and the other piece of that, I'd I, I tell you, Neil, is, we really try to publicize when they do come back. And we've, we've run some stories um, showing people in our organization, hey, here's you know, three or four people that have come back to this organization, and here's why they came back. We don't, we don't have them talk about, you know, I didn't like where I went, but what brought you back? What were the characteristics? What were the qualities? Or what were the strengths of Keywood that brought you back to the organization? And so that's been really good as well to continue to kind of highlight those folks. So if anyone has doubts that they might see somebody else and realize, oh, okay, well, that didn't work out for them, or maybe the grass isn't as green on the other side. Tom, when, when people talk about what it is that, that brings them back, uh, what are some of the, the trends or themes that pop there? I mean, really a lot of it is the overall culture and, and kind of the uh, Kiwit has, has always kind of brought together more of a, we, we have a lot of folks that go out to job sites and projects and they spend a lot of time together. So it's a really strong kind of family atmosphere there. But at the same time, you know, Kiwit has always been safety is our number one priority. And so they see, you know, the extreme that, that Kiwit goes to make sure that the environment are safe and, and, and so forth. So really, I think it's a lot of not only the people, it's what we build. We tend to build large projects that our people tend to have a lot of pride in what they've done and, and come back and say, hey, you know, they'll tell a fam family member or a friend, hey, I, I built that. And I think they lose that sometimes by going to different uh, organizations. Matt, this, the, the theme of safety, I and mean, it kind of it comes up in our data. We saw all that stuff about burnout and mental health. You know, it's, it's on here as one of the things that people cite about coming back. Are those, just, have, you, have you been seeing those sorts of challenges and, and anything that you've tried or, or thought about in terms of working on that kind of wellness idea? Yeah, uh, and, you know, when I think about safety, I think about, um, uh, you know, some of the things that we've tried that relate to safety, you know, personal health, whether that's physical or, you know, or mental. So one strategy that we're in the middle, we're, we're about halfway done now is on-site uh, health clinics. So six of our 12 locations have on-site clinics. They're on-site, they're either low cost or no cost. And we've got really high quality providers who love all the patient time they get. And, and it, it spans from pre-employment, uh, to, you know, our annual biometrics and the incentives that we provide there. It becomes our employee's primary doctor for them, their spouse, their, their children that are on our plan. Uh, and then it also serves for disease management. So some of the high cost, high, you know, uh, concern health issues that happen to people. So it spans a big spectrum of support for mental health, physical health, safety, and uh, we, we think it plays a role in attracting and retaining uh, people, really good people. We're in, we tend to be in small rural communities where um, uh, we have a good relationship with the community and our health clinics kind of put us over the top there in favor uh, in, in the communities where we, where we serve. So that, that's one strategy that's been really good. And by the end of next year, we'll have 12 uh, onsite clinics across all, all of our locations. 
And, and Neil, I might, I might add something there, you know, that's, that's been obviously you, you hear, especially from recent grads, you know, mental health is very important to them and, and making sure that what do we do and how do we support that? You know, we had a 40% uptick in the EAP utilization during COVID, which I'm sure most companies did. Um, you know, I think the joke is, oh, you had your spouses both together at home all that time. You know, that was kind of the, the joke behind that. But, um, but you know, the big part of, of that is we realized that we kept driving the communication via kind of the HR benefits team. And we switched it here in the last year to it is a cohort of safety and HR. But the message is really driven as an overall safety concept. And we branded it under the hat, again, having the construction piece. So we we forced out to every single person who has a Kiwit phone, an app that shows all the resources, the tools, and it goes directly uh, to our EAP program. And then uh, the other thing, everyone has it in their signature lines um, at, uh, at, you know, here's where you can click to, to get to those numbers, get to those resources. And then we recently switched from, we had four uh, free sessions annually to eight free sessions uh, annually. Um, that's just for the same situation. So if, if you had an anxiety issue, that's eight free sessions. If you had a death, that's eight free sessions. So it, it just varies. And, and by calendar year, we'll, uh, um, you'll get another eight for the exact same thing. And then the other thing, we do have some sitters and we had folks that were explaining that we had a hard time you know, what company do you work for? And, and particularly, you would, that's how you would log in and get the number. We worked with our EAP and it's a dedicated number just for our organization. So we don't have to worry about, are they going to the right spot? Uh, I, it is always a mistake to generalize um, from talent stuff that's going on at McKinsey. But uh, uh, regardless, we, we've had a, a very similar sort of experience, um, we are bringing in, we always bring in young folks, right? So people who are right out of college or graduate school and uh, the reports and, and sort of the kind of the cases that have arisen from a mental health standpoint have, have been on the rise for some time, but just skyrocketed in the last, in the last two years, um, which, which has me meant that, you know, we've had to put a number of things into place some of the, the kind of EAP type uh, type things that you're talking about and, and access to a whole host of resources, but also we've had to rethink some of the flexibility things that we do, right? You know, so various ways in which we allow people to take breaks and and uh, and think about leave and, and and other means of flexibility as as sort of options to recharge have been have been not just you know important for us. They've probably been you know it's been required. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to keep our people. Matt, I think uh, you might've had something you were going to contribute. Yeah. Uh, you know, on, on mental health, I think, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd echo the, the John's thoughts on the proliferation of demand for mental health services. And it's not just, I think what, what we've learned is you can't just offer more of the same. We have to offer a wider variety that help to reach different employees that have different needs. And so, uh, you know, our employee assistance program has proliferated, the use has proliferated a lot in the last couple of years, but we, add, we had MD Live for physical health, for example, we added a mental health component. So now there's that option. Um, Tony Giardo is on this call, he's from Marketplace Chaplains. We've partnered with a cha an onsite chaplain uh, organization uh, for a lot of years, and we expanded recently to all of our locations to give another way for people to find someone to listen, you know, someone that will meet with them on site or off site. So, chaplains, uh, you know, MD Live for mental health, our EAP, or some of the things that we're experimenting with to see if we can have something for everybody that needs, you know, support in those ways. Thank you, Cindy. Maybe, maybe uh, let me check in with you. Uh, how's the chat? Any uh, any comments or questions coming from the group? Not yet. Uh, come on, you guys, ask a question. <laughs> but I do have one question that I'd like to ask, if it's okay. Are any of you guys bringing back retirees?
Matt, John, even uh, McKenzie. I'll, I'll start. So, um, Cindy, it's a good question. We, we're having a higher rate of retirements than we've seen before. We don't like that. Uh, and there's a variety of reasons uh, why, but we, we, the migration of retirees earlier has happened. Um, we're trying really hard. We haven't really been successful at keeping those that want to retire full-time, but we're a lot more creative about part-time employment and taking skills or experiences that you know retirees have and plugging them in. So long-term, a 30-plus year DOT employee is now leading our charitable committee because we needed some help there. And that's all they do. And they do it in retirement, you know, X number of, of uh, hours per month. So we're trying to be more creative there, but we've had a lot more success with uh, part-time than keeping retirees or bringing them back in you know, a full-time. And Cindy, I would have asked, I would have answered that exactly the same. I would almost call it uh, delaying the full retirement to <clears throat> offering even more flexibility uh, so that they're getting to do some of the things they want and still be able to kind of help us out during that transition period. Great. While we, so while you guys were talking, there's two more questions that came in. Uh, one's from Adrian O'Hara, and this is for you, John. Uh, I'm curious, before moving to eight sessions, if you saw many of your users of EAP maxing out the four sessions for mental health. Um, really, really kind of came down to do what do we feel like is the right amount uh, to help people out and not having to pay for it out of pocket. Obviously, the insurance will kick in after four if you need to continue to see a, a mental health provider, but obviously that will go against deductibles and so forth. And we wanted to make it uh, something that there is no cost uh, for those individuals up to the eight sessions, to be real honest with you. Great. So another question from Fred, and this is to all of you guys. Many are also suffering with financial stresses. Do your well-being approaches programs include financial assistance or advisory services? Ours do. Can you exp can you expand expand on what that means? I mean, if you just call into the EAP, they have a variety of resources and, and individuals that they will refer you out to to get that type of help. Or there are some also online type options. There's a variety of things from that standpoint. We um, I'll speak to financial uh, wellness because I'm really glad the question came up. Uh, we, we we talk about financial wellness along with other forms of wellness pretty often. So we, we enlisted a small a local firm here that does financial coaching and took us a while to find somebody that won't sell product. All they yeah. do is coach. And so we combine the coaching from this uh, firm that we partner with, with um, an online resource that you can buy. So they partner with that. Um, and it provides coaching to employees on saving for retirement, for children's uh, education or weddings, uh, things like that. And um, we get a lot of use uh, out of that program. There, there's one-on-one -on -one coaching in person or virtual. There's classes that we offer. And then there's this online component. So that in the last three to four years um, has become more prominent and the utilization of that service is, is really grown. One of the things that, that we've done a little bit of research on, at least enough to point us in a direction on, is that when we look at benefits and their uh, overall, the world of benefits and, and sort of what is the relative value, the perception of value in aggregate for, for employees, uh, the, the, the perception of values, the perceived value that employees have in, in a benefit for all of the wellness related things that includes health, mental health, as well as financial health have been rising steadily over the last five years um, with, with an acceleration in the last two. And, and relative to some of the other more traditional benefits that, that companies uh, offer. So it, it, is, it is one of the trends. And I think that it's one of the things that we're, we're trying to work through in some research that we're doing now is how, how far does that extend? Like, how do we think about things that, that used to be perks, um, whether that was, you know, uh, membership in a local gym or access to discounted childcare or anything like that? Are those part of what we are seeing in wellness? We don't actually know. And so maybe it's a question for you guys. Um, but, uh, but, but 
the overall relative perception of value for some of these things is rising. So we've got seven, we got seven more mess, uh, questions. Will Crooks asked to engage employees, how important is supporting social causes and the environment? And I will, I will say that I just saw a McKinsey Insight report on, in my email yesterday or today that talks about this. So Neil, you might want to weigh in on this as well as Matt and John. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move to this page. The, the answer I think is, is important that it, it's important. Um, the, the context for that is, you know, what we see companies doing broadly is, uh, is, is sort of, we can try to bring it together in four themes. Um, a lot, if I, if I kind of re return to that point of, it seems like relational aspects of work have increased in importance relative to transactional aspects of employment over, over time. We don't see that trend necessarily turning around. And when you think about things like some of the health stuff that we are talking about or have been talking about, when you see the things at the top of that chart, like a sense of belonging and, and a sense of community, the role of managers is hugely, hugely important. Um, and we probably have not necessarily prepared or at least rewarded our managers in, in aggregate, I should say, uh, to focus on and and value that part of the job relative to some of the performance and technical parts of the job. And this is one thing that we're seeing is a re-emphasis on that. You know, the second is, 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 I think maybe Cindy, a little bit of an answer to your question, or at least it's part of the answer to your question. Um, it, it, the word purpose is a bit of a buzzword, but every time we do real research on this, asking employees or employers around the question of, how do you see your purpose and how do you connect that to the purpose of the organization? It, it really magnifies in terms of people's uh, motivation at work, in terms of their desire to stay in their job. Uh, it actually has, we tend to find incredibly high correlations between people answering that they feel a sense of purpose and work with just straight sort of life outcomes, including physical health. Uh, so we don't want to make more of it than it is, but every time we do some work on this, it seems like it really matters. Now, how does that then relate to some of the social stuff that you're talking about, Cindy? It, it, it does matter in the sense that you don't have to work for a company that's off fighting for causes that you believe in to find purpose and work. But if a company is actively working against things you believe in, it'll be hard to keep that employee. And so that's a really sort of ambiguous line to draw um, and, and what companies should do. And I don't think this is an easy thing for any, any organization in today's world. And the only thing that we've been seeing that is sort of universally helpful in terms of guidance on this is that organizations are, are investing more and considerably more in, in what they do to listen to employees and, and listening in the sense of asking them, also passively listening, what matters, what things really matter, what things make, make a difference in how you perceive your value in the organization and your connection to its purpose. Um, and then I think that answer will probably be different for different organizations, but the, the underlying truth of it is, is that if you're, not, if you're too far away from how your workforce thinks about some of these things, it'll be really hard to keep your workforce in today's day and age. I don't know, John, Matt, it, it, these, are, these are tough questions. So that it's not like there's an easy answer, but what are your thoughts? You know, I think there's a lot of organizations doing, I agree with what you said, Neil, completely. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are doing a lot of good things from an employment standpoint. And I, I look at social causes or charitable efforts or philanthropic efforts to be, for some people, what helps to separate, you know, the good from the great. And so I think it's important to keep, you know, an eye on the ball and to be active in many ways, not just donating money, but a food company like us, we have food we can donate and we do. We just sent a couple of truckloads to Ukraine that employees help to pay for. So I think you have to stay current and relevant. I think you have to have a variety of ways for people to um, see that they're with an organization that's doing things that they care about. Um, but you can't just do that stuff and not 
have a solid base as an organization. You have to do the other blocking and tackling that help to find and, and keep good people. John, maybe you have other thoughts. No, I mean, I agree. And I, I think it's uh, always been an interesting topic, especially, you know, you think about the difference between public and private sector as well, too, right? I mean, who's your customer base? Um, that A lot of that, you know, varies. And I, I would say, you know, the social aspect and supporting and showing you're supporting your, your employee base has really been kind of our overall continued focus, right? So Neil, um, I've got several other questions. Um, Tony, I think your question was answered. He asked about how the mission of the company kind of plays into attraction and retention. I think the answer you guys gave earlier kind of answers that. Uh, Rick asked, what are you doing to enrich jobs and make them more meaningful? Well, back, back to Tony's question, I would say, you know, one thing if, if you're looking for like opportunities or resources or whatever, we, we I, I, you know, I think we used to several, several years ago, we would go out, we would do all this recruitment uh, uh, handouts and all this. And, and I think we were saying things that we thought we needed to be saying to attract people to our organization. And, you know, five years ago, we actually did a uh, employment branding survey. Um, and the whole thing of that was based on hearing directly from people why did they stay with our company and what are what are those things? And now all of our marketing tools and resources, and as we're talking to employees coming in, we're able to talk directly to, hey, here's why people are staying at this company. And so the the like the example I brought up on, you know, pride and and hey, I built that, I was part of that, was definitely one of the biggest things that that came back from that that uh, research. So uh, Thomas Smouse asks or, or make, make, makes a statement that their EAP program also offers a variety of financial well-being and they had a 401k provider offer a couple of savings for the future. It was not financial planning. And then Tony actually uh, uh, is commenting on that. And he said he heard just yesterday from a client that they use Smart Dollar and his employees have retired 43,000 in debt this year alone. So there's some options right there from people in the audience around what they're doing uh, around the financial well-being. Any comments or anything you want to add? Okay. Um, so Neil quit sharing and I lost my chat. <laughs> Sorry about that. Not my intent. <laughs> So, Neil, can you see the chat? Because there's, me, there's some questions. Matt, you, you mentioned the online financial support for DOT. And then Rick Byers says, do, do what extent are you using coaching to accelerate yeah. career advancement, acceptance of change, and trans transition receptivity to DE and I and B? Yeah, so I think I can I can start with that, and then I'd love to hear what uh, what others think. But um, the one of the reasons why you know we we have zeroed in on on the role of managers that when you think about what equity and inclusion in particular really are driven by, it's distributed decisions that individuals make, whether it's about a promotion or a raise, you know, whether there's and you know, intended or unintended bias, and mostly it's unintended, there often is people are people, right? There's cognitive biases all over the place. So you wanna to try to figure out how to get after that from an equity standpoint. And then from an inclusion standpoint, it really is about the day-to-day -day interactions that an, an individual has with the people who are around them that drives a sense of inclusion, of feeling part of something that is bigger than yourself. Um, and, and the, the, the thing that we have found is that really building those capabilities of teams and of the team leaders is, is, the, is the thing that, that drives kind of disproportionate impact. Now, that's a really hard thing to do, right? Building individual capabilities is, is hard and time intensive and resource intensive, but it, it is the, that investment matters. And so within that, we see a role for training um, and learning, but coaching from an adult learning standpoint is equally, if not more impactful 
from building those sorts of capabilities. And so, yes, we've absolutely seen coaching. Uh, now, how you do that at scale is, is a problem to be solved because it's not that easy to figure out how to do that. And, and there are interesting ways to kind of use e sort of the, uh, the network effects and things like that to, to do that, but it's, it's not necessarily a straightforward problem to solve. So Neil, there's a, uh, there's a question from Bill Elvin. He's, and he basically says it seems a bit contrarian to suggest a manager's impact is more critical than other factors with all of the push towards self-managed teams and the move away from traditional hierarchical manager. Any yeah, comments think, on that? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, a, it's a good point. It, I think that probably the vast, vast, vast majority of the workforce still exists in you know more hierarchical manager employee relations relationships um and so you know so where where those movements are happening and and they are happening right i think that there's a lot of value in in some of those agile concepts and how you know we're thinking about different ways to to have product oriented teams and self-managed teams and all that stuff it, that's where the capability is less manager to employee and employee team team to team Right where those sorts of of ideas around, you know, driving a sense of inclusion of of interacting in the right way, are are part of the working norms of a self managed team. Um, but but there's still you know the I, I don't know the number. I'm going to make it up. Ninety something percent of the workforce that works in in a more traditional manager uh, employee relationship. So Neil, that's the end of the questions from chat. Uh, are there any other questions you might want to ask Matt or John? Well, well let me open up to, 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 to you guys in just kind of an open, open-ended way. It's like what, you know, we've, we've talked about a set of things that are going on in the workforce, challenges, as well as opportunities. You know, as you, as you step back and think about, you know, what, what are the most important things on your minds and your kind of agendas going forward, what, what, uh, what rises to the top? Maybe John, you want to start? Oh yeah, I mean, really, it really is a lot of it's on the recruitment and the retention this year, and and also the whole culture piece. I mean, we we heard that obviously during COVID that you know people weren't able to go do the lunches, they weren't able to do the happy hours, they weren't able to connect with the people that they were typically working with before, and so we've actually been back for quite some time in the office, and and so we really encouraged you know, getting people back and connected with their folks. And, and even if that's, you know, get leaving early on a work day or, or whatever the case may be. But it's interesting because, you know, you, you hear about the retention and, and some people will bring it up and I'll be like, well, yeah, but we're also, you know, we may be losing people, but we're definitely benefiting from that as well. I mean, we've, we've brought in, you know, 2000 new people to the organization. And, and I said, we got to keep that in mind, but now it's important that we are retaining them and onboarding them appropriately. Uh, uh, from that standpoint. Um, I agree with what John shared. You know, one of the things that we're thinking about maybe differently that is either mid COVID or late COVID um, is we put together a culture committee, which we'd never done before. So we, we've been in business for 60 plus years and often refer to culture, even when we don't mean the same thing. When two different people say culture at dot foods, I think there was a little bit of a disconnect. So we're working on culture very specifically and intentionally. And the, the goal is quite simply to make sure culture's still a competitive advantage in the future, like it has been up till now. So we've got a committee of about 20 people from around the business, and we're doing a ton of work right now, benchmarking best companies. There's actually some good culture groups out there. Uh, Southwest Airlines, who you know wrote some of the book on culture uh, hosts uh, some events. There's a culture fellowship um, that we've got uh, some folks going to later this year. And so we're trying to think about a culture more intentionally and all that that means for us. And as our business grows, it's harder to manage culture. So um, we're about a year into it. We're still pretty early, but uh, we think that that is another strategy from a talent perspective that, um, that hopefully will help. And Matt, as you were talking, one more question came in. How do you measure and improve the facets of culture? 
you know, I think we're all probably different uh, in how we do it. Um, you know, um, our, there's, there's two ways that rise to the top, Cindy, uh, but there's probably others. Our annual big employee survey is one. Um, we do the, we use the great place to work survey. We've used a number of others in the past. So that's one measure of culture. And we typically take the 60 or so great place to work questions. And we uh, take the components that we feel like best reflect our culture. And we index that over time. And then we do internal 360s. All managers and most employees go through a 360 process. And our 360 questions are directly tied to our five company values. And so we think that gives us a more of an internal measure measurement on culture, but those are probably the two top ways that we measure um, culture at DOT. Awesome. Uh, it's a topic that we, at McKinsey, we have, we have deeply held opinions about, um, uh, which, which I, not to, I won't get too far into it, but one of the things that we think when, when we try to define culture, it's not how you feel about the place, but rather how, how do you do what you do? How does the place work on a day-to-day -day basis? And when we think about it that way, what we've been able to do is try to distill that to a set of actual behaviors or practices, ways in which managers interact with their employees or ways in which leaders express direction to the organization, ways in which you renew your capabilities that you can you can actually say did this happen or did this not happen to someone like did you observe this practice happening or did you not um, and we've we've gotten that down to what are it's basically 37 practices that we measure and when you look at the frequency of those practices as well as whether or not people perceive those practices to be positive in outcome versus negative in outcome we're kind of able to put that together into something that, that we think measures culture and that is it's our our way to do it but we've we've been doing it for something like 20 years and at this point of all the dogma that i inherited or have learned from my time and it's been 15 years at, at mckinsey it's the one thing that i am like just confident we're right on and I'm sure you have a lot more to say about that topic, Neil, <laughs> but unfortunately we're like at time. We've got a minute. And I just want to take that minute to say thanks to Neil. He's amazing. Matt, John, you guys were great. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I want to share a couple of things. Our next thought leadership event is on June 22nd. Fred's, Fred Hinke of Siegel is going to be talking about kind of the next three year predictions. And because we really believe that wellness and well being is so critical, we've also are kicking off a the best of the best in wellness and well being uh, innovators starting in June. So we're, we're going to have eight sessions where we kind of highlight what we see as the best of the best. And we're using someone that has, is working closely. He's been an innovator for years in this field and working closely with the provider to uh, really highlight who's the best out there since there's so many. So thanks to everybody for being here. We appreciate your attendance and we appreciate you guys participating and being the thought leaders today. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye.